Representative Halverson, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. On your campaign website, uh, you say growing our educational excellence is my top priority. What did you mean by that and is it still your top priority going into the 2018 session? Well, education is always a top priority, I think, for everybody at the legislature, and it's a top priority for me because it's so important to the community of Egan. Um, when people uh, talk about what they're proud of in our community, our schools are always at the top of the list. So making sure that we're doing what we can to invest in our schools in a way that prepares kids for the 21st century, I think, um, impacts so much of our society and our economy for the future. So. Uh, education continues to be extremely important. Healthcare is always also something now that's on everybody's mind, and that's somewhat a place where I have some policy expertise. So, working to control healthcare costs is also on my list. And you represent just under two thirds of Egan, a city served by three public school districts, and I believe two are in your district. Do the needs of schools in your area differ from other areas of the state? Well, I think that we're experiencing a lot of change in our schools as other, other places are, particularly when you look at the number of families that are experiencing pover poverty. Suburban poverty is something that tends to be a little more hidden, um, but I've gotten involved in working on issues around youth homelessness because of experiences that our schools were having, mental health in the schools. Um, the schools are such a touch point for the community. And it's a pl place where so many issues um, that are impacting our families get raised. And so everything from hunger to poverty to, to homelessness gets raised in the schools. Um, the other thing that is really important in our Egan School Districts is the partnerships that our school district has uh, put together with our local businesses, Thomson Reuters and other um, innovative companies who are looking for the next generation of innovators and leaders. Um, and so there's been a lot of public-private partnership to make sure that we are preparing our students for uh, the jobs of the future. And uh, the jobs are changing much more quickly than they were when I was growing up. And we have to be sure that our schools are um, very focused on making sure we're preparing kids for the future. You serve on the Commerce, Government Operations and Health and Human Services Finance Committee. Do you see any major issues that should be addressed in the 2018 session? Well, um, Health and Human Services is a, is a big area. Um, and I, since I serve on the Finance Committee, that budget is, is the biggest part of the state's budget. And so making sure that we are working as hard as we can to um, find efficiencies in the system with healthcare, with the Department of Human Services, um, but also really digging in and addressing what's driving the cost of health care for, for Minnesotans. It's a concern, it's an economic concern for almost every family I talk to. And if people have good insurance, they're worried about losing it. If they don't um, have good insurance, they're paying too much essentially to be uninsured. And um, when they are paying for services at hospitals and clinics, um, they need to know that they're getting the most value that they can. And so we need to dig in and dig get down to the root of what's driving the costs in our healthcare system and make sure that we're helping people be healthier. So uh, there's a lot of work to do there for sure. <laughs> so you're in your third term and you're one of six assistant House Minority Caucus leaders. What does that entail? Well, I uh, get to represent my colleagues in the House. So they, um, rep they ask me to help represent them when we um, talk about our caucus priorities. I'm a suburban member. Um, we haven't had a lot of uh, suburban members that have been long-serving members. Um, it's a new trend in, in government and politics. I come from a, a pretty red district, if you will. And so um, having, making sure that we're addressing the needs of our communities and the suburbs is very important, um, as well as making sure that um, the work that's being done outside the Capitol, that uh, folks are getting to see the House DFL caucus outside the Capitol and the work that, that we're doing. So I get to represent um, our caucus uh, at different points around the state as well. You also talk about bipartisanship on your campaign website. It's something that you've been an advocate of. Mm -hmm. um, in politics today, it seems working with the other side is a little bit more difficult. Is that fair to say? You know, um, you always have to have a partner who's willing to dance with you, right? Otherwise, you look kind of silly on the dance floor. Um, so you need, a, you need a willing partnership, and you need a coalition of the willing. I think that the more um, seats that there are um, that are not considered in play, uh, more people who, who represent s safe districts, um, that creates a real problem for the legislature because people are not working to represent their entire communities. They're representing a, a, you know, a portion of their community that gets them elected. And I'm from one of those districts that they consider a swing district. And 
I work hard to make sure I represent my whole community. I think it makes me a better legislator. Um, it also uh, makes me a better partner when it comes to bipartisan issues. And so I've um, been recognized by colleagues on the other side of the aisle as somebody who, you know, they can work with, they like to work with. I'm a firm believer that policy making is a team process. And every time, whether I've been in the majority or the major minority, um, when I've gotten impact on my bills um, from whichever side of the aisle, my bills have always gotten better, right? Um, and so we want to be sure that that process continues to take place. And there's a lot of places where we do have um, bipartisan agreement. Working on the Homeless Youth Act is a great example. That was a spending bill. Um, we, uh, put, we've now put $11.5 million into homeless youth um, programs, and that has been done in both DFL majorities and Republican majorities. I've worked with uh, Representative Anna Wills to um, make that a priority for the Republican caucus as well as the DFL caucus, and it's a statewide issue. So um, there are places where it works, and we have to, um, we have to make it a priority to work with other, other folks across the aisle. You come from four generations of legislators, including your uncle Pete Nelson and grandfather Howard Nelson. Was it always your intention to follow in their footsteps? It was not. Um, it was a big part of my life growing up. My grandfather served in the Minnesota House and the Minnesota Senate, um, and I did a lot of parades as a kid and a lot of door knocking as a child, um, and uh, for my uncle as well. He served in the legislature, and um, my grandfather's uncle was the first one from the, our side of the family who served in a, he was the leader of the Wisconsin Assembly in the 20s, so we go back far um, of Scandinavian legislators. Uh, I um, am not the same party as the rest of my family, and so that's made me, I think, a very good listener and legislator. I've learned a lot from my grandfather. He taught me you have to be willing to change your mind. Um, he taught me how to listen to other people's opinions, um, taught me how to be a critical thinker, and uh, you know, unfortunately for them, that led me to be a DFLer. But <laughs> it also makes me um, really understand that uh, folks who have different political views um, are not the enemy, right? That we have opportunities to work together. And so I've been really fortunate to have their um, leadership to guide me. But um, I didn't think I was going to be sitting in one of these desks at any time in my life. So. Will we see your son here someday? Is he going to follow in the footsteps of his? When he. Um, when I was first uh, sworn in, um, in 2013, he um, was up at the speaker's roster with me for a photograph, and as he was walking down, three-year-old little guy, he said, that's cool up there, I'd like to work there. So, we might have a fifth generation.